Very good. Awesome. Um, I realised after I was listening to Ken's <laughs> keynote speech yesterday that I have written a very poor keynote speech. I have no photographs of myself hanging out with the women at Whangarei Rape Crisis and the Need Rape Crisis. I have no photographs of myself checking out START or Male Survivors Trust in Christchurch. I have no photos of myself hanging out with Rainbow Youth or Shakti or disability organisations in Auckland. I don't even, and you know this is coming, right? I don't even have any photographs of myself in Hollywood. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> then there would have been some photos, Kenny, eh? <laughs> if you want to see the photos that um, are part of Imagine the Solutions work, you need to log on to our Facebook page and like us there, okay? There's all kinds of stuff on there. Okay, now I'm going to start properly, though. That was just a warm up. <laughs> Um, when we named this stream Changing the World, this, this presentation and the workshops following it Changing the World, I wanted to set up some space to talk about how we do the wider social change stuff that we need to do if we want to live in communities free of sexual violence. Because I think we all know that a program, no matter how wonderful it is, isn't going to end rape culture, right? We all know that a poster campaign, a social norms campaign, isn't going to change rape culture. We all know that ah, anything isn't going to change rape culture. So I wanted to find a way to talk about some of the things we need to do if we want to foster the social norms that we need. So this stream is really a how rather than a what stream, OK? Last year at the Tauiwi Prevention Stream, we introduced the idea of, um, or the metaphor of the vegetable garden as a way to think about and talk about primary prevention of sexual violence. So when we think about what we need to grow healthy vegetables, we know we need to do more than pull out the plants we don't want, the weeds, in a vegetable garden. We know that we need to have enough sunshine and enough water and compost in our soil we know we need a healthy growing environment if we want our vegetables to flourish, right? Sexual violence prevention is exactly the same. If we want to live in communities free of sexual violence, we need to do more than respond with compassion, care and skill to survivors after sexual violence has happened. As important and life-changing as that work is, we need to do more then create programs that stop sexual offenders offending, as important as that work is. We need to find ways that foster social norms of respect and equity across gender, across race, across class, across disability, across sexuality, so that we can build respect between people and respect between peoples. OK, I need someone to click for me, actually. Kim, can you click that? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. No. Oh, yep, yep. And, no, no, no. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Strange. <laughs> there's, there's a title on my sheet of that, but never mind. <laughs> um, it brings me, that, that intro just brings me to, to today, to this, this presentation, which is about how we might use the media to change the world. Now, I hope it's not going to be controversial for me to say that the media is how most people in our communities, most of the general public, come to understand sexual violence. Yeah, you know, here's a coverage we don't have, right? It's how, so the, the, the stories the media tells about sexual violence end up being what most people in our communities believe to be true about sexual violence. Today I'm gonna to talk about the work of the Tauiwi Project's media audit. I'm gonna talk about how we've been using those results so far and what we're intending to continue doing with those results. Kim, can you put this? You might need to look at me. <laughs> Before I do that, though, I want to let everybody know what journalists in this country currently receive around sexual violence. So every, every baby journalist, every student journalist gets this book. It's the only thing they all get. It's 453 pages long. It's got a, um, instructions on how to cover sport, crime, politics, finance, community issues, social issues, all kinds of things. It's pretty weighty, right? It has three sentences reporting on sexual violence. 
The first sentence they get, I said they get three sentences. The first sentence they get lets them know about name suppression. That's great. The next two sentences, yep, let them know that false reporting is common of sexual violence. Okay, so that's the baseline that every student journalist in the country starts with when it comes to reporting on sexual violence. That's all the information they get at the moment. I think it's important to understand the context when we look at how the media actually reports. Okay, so looking now at what we actually did, we took the two largest print outlets in New Zealand, stuff.co.nz and the New Zealand Herald, we looked at six months' worth of print media coverage between the beginning of April 2012 and the end of September 2012. Those two online sources between them cover the newspapers, the New Zealand Herald, the Dominion Post, the Waikato Times, the Taranaki Daily News, the Marlborough Express, the Nelson Mail, the Press, the Timaru Herald and the Southland Times. So with the exception of the Otago Daily Times, it's pretty much the major newspapers in New Zealand. We looked at, over this, those six months, how articles were talking about sexual violence and who was being quoted in the story. So how was the media telling the story of sexual violence to our communities? And we identified 102 news reports over that period that were addressing sexual violence. I want to let everyone know now that the, um, that the stories are pretty triggering, I would say. If people need to jump out of the room for a minute and grab a cup of tea, I'm not going to be offended. Taking a break from rape culture is to be applauded. So do that if you need to, okay? So what did we find? The first thing we found... <laughs> ..is that most of the time, sexual violence stories become national stories. Okay, 70% of the time, if a story's being reported in one paper, it's going to be picked up by lots of papers. When that's not happening, they're shared pretty evenly between ur urban and rural papers. What kinds of stories? 70% focused on court proceedings. That has real impacts for, for the kinds of sexual violence that isn't getting reported. It means they're not turning up in our media reports at all. Okay. 96% of the time our articles at the moment are reactive. What that means is that they're reporting on an event or a series of events of sexual violence. They're not covering sexual violence as a social issue pretty much at all at the moment in our print media. And we've got one in five of our stories looking at child sexual abuse, almost exclusively historic cases in court. In our 102 news stories, there was one male victim, and all of the accused, of, all the people accused of raping, were male. Turning next to who was being quoted, we had 161 people being quoted in our 102 news stories. The largest body of quotes, 63%, is coming from the justice sector. Unsurprisingly, given the court reporting is a big focus, in the, for the purposes of this graph, that means defence lawyers, Crown prosecutors and judges. Okay, So people that are arguing about sexual violence in court are taking up the bulk of our quotes in our newspaper articles. Around about one in five of our articles are co um, quotes are coming from survivors and their supporters. That's almost exclusively victim impact statements at the end of a court case. And then we've got around about one in five again, quotes coming from the accused and their supporters, except that that blue chunk over here, the employer's chunk, all of the employers were the people that were employing people accused of rape. So actually, one in three of our quotes are coming from people who are talking about the impacts on the accused of being accused of rape. Those are the people that are getting quoted. The people that aren't getting quoted, which I think is almost, if not more, interesting, we've got New Zealand police appearing just 17, in just 17% of our quotes. That's lower than for any other kind of crime. So the police aren't talking about sexual violence in our media at the moment, really, at all. Even lower still, though, that orange segment there, that's us. 8% of the time, just 8% of the time, are we part of the stories around sexual violence. And unfortunately, there's another, another segment in there which is pretty important, which is specialist researchers and academics. They're being quoted 0% of the time. Okay? So perhaps unsurprisingly, when we think about where journalists start and we, when we think about who they're talking to, we have some commonly held but untrue beliefs cropping up in our media stories. Kim, hello. 
There's six of these. I'm going to chunk through these pretty quickly. They're going to be pretty familiar to people in the room, I think. Yep. Um, <clears throat> and I'm really more interested in talking about how we change them, to be honest. Please go back. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the first, the first commonly held but untrue belief. There's euphemisms littering our stories about sexual violence in the media at the moment. The most common one is referring to child sexual abuse, rape and sexual violence as sex throughout our stories, okay? It's happening in one in five of our stories. There's also a real lack of clarity around consent, which means that the trauma and the impacts of sexual violence on survivors are invisible in our media stories at the moment. When you're not calling something what it is, how can we know the trauma that it causes? <laughs> Number two, the old faithful. Women lie about being raped. Now, can you go back, come please? So the, um, <clears throat> the main way this is playing out in our media stories is that when the person who's been accused of raping is someone's partner or ex-partner, when there is little sign of struggle, or when the person accused of child sexual abuse doesn't look like a paedophile, we have implications in our stories that sexual violence hasn't really happened. The other way this plays out is when the police choose not to continue prosecuting someone, at the moment the only media language around this is that that person has been cleared of sexual assault. It's a very different message than the police choosing not to continue to prosecute. And we all know how bad our attrition rates are. Okay, related to the myth around survivors lying about being raped, our ideas around violence, stranger danger. And what we're, what we're seeing, whenever there is only a small amount of physical injury or no physical injury at all, the media are believing that that means sexual violence hasn't occurred. There's a real lack of awareness that usually sexual violence happens through pressure, coercion and threats. This story that we've put up here is of a girl, a child, because she only has a one centimetre tear in her body, the article is reporting that sexual violence probably hasn't happened. Let's go. Okay, next, 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 um, next myth. <clears throat> one in three of our quotes are coming from people who know the person who's accused of rape, who's, who are his friend, his neighbour, his employer. Unsurprisingly, the stories they're going to tell about that man are good stories. Hey, they're his friend. The confusion around that for the media, I think, is because there is no focus on offending behaviour, they are using whether or not someone's a nice guy to decide whether or not they're a rapist. We know how dangerous that is. We have an example here, and, and Ken talked to this one yesterday, where someone that actually community members knew was, do, was doing things, um, was doing sexually abusive things to children. It was being missed because that man didn't look like a rapist in the community. Next one. This is really interesting, I think. In one in four of our stories, we have significantly more attention being paid to the men who are accused of rape than to the survivors of rape. So this plays out in a couple of ways. Firstly, throughout the investigation process, we have a lot of attention being paid on how awful it is for the man accused of rape, the implications on his social life, his employment, etc. We see this playing out even after sexual violence convictions are made, though. So this is an article from the Nelson Mail. It's a story about a young woman, really, a 13-year-old whose rapist is in prison now. The entire focus of the article is how awful it would be to be accused of rape. You'll see there at one point the journalist compares it to being buried alive, at no point in this article, not even one sentence, concerns how awful it would be to be a 13-year-old raped by a friend of your family. Not one sentence. And the old faithful, she's asking for it. <laughs> this plays out in our media stories with the amount of attention that journalists give to how women are dressed, what women are doing, what women are drinking, who women are hanging out with, and their employment if they're working in the sex industry. 
Journalists don't do this for any other kind of crime. And we all know the impacts this has on our community in terms of who our community thinks is responsible for sexual violence. Thanks, Garth. Okay, that was a brutally quick <laughs> run through the results of the media order. There's a report over there on the table, which people who are interested can, um, can grab later and read about it in a bit more detail. The report was a very collaborative effort. I want to acknowledge the work of Nicola Wood, who's a feminist master's media studies student who was really involved in some of the early, early media collation with me. And also there was considerable input from the Tauiwi um, Advisory Group, Tauiwi Project Advisory Group, and the Academic Advisory Group. And I also spoke to some other people around the world who are doing similar work. There is a whole bunch of media work at the moment happening around the world, which is pretty exciting. Yeah. What the report includes, we've got recommendations for how journalists can tell more accurate stories about sexual violence. We've got some information for them about the law, about prevalence of sexual violence, about who it happens to and what those impacts are. And importantly, given who they're currently not talking to, we've got a list of media experts in there for them to talk to. So what are we doing now? There's three strands of work that have come out of the media audit results. The first strand's to do with the media. I am really interested the journalism training organisation getting rid of the three sentences in here and replacing them with the many sentences in here. <laughs> what, we've, um, what we've done about that is we've approached the journalism training organisation and rather than me doing that, I had a feeling they might think I was biased. <laughs> and it's true, I am biased, I believe survivors. Um, we've asked New Zealand Police to front that for us. We believe that if New Zealand Police were going to the journalism training organisation and saying it's not okay to be talking about false complaints in this way, that they would listen. So I'm very grateful for Tasha, to Tasha Penny for fronting that for us. Tasha is not able to be with us today because of family illness, but I'm very grateful to her work in this area. I thought you might be interested in what we're asking reporters to do, what our recommendations are. So on the advice of some ex-journalists, we've chunked it down very, very, very simply. This was one of the areas that the Tauiwi um, advisory group were very strict with me around. No, Sandra, you can't spend 20 pages on that rape myth. They're not going to read about it. <laughs> so we've got three key areas of recommendations. The first is that we want reporters to describe sexual violence accurately. We want them to get rid of the euphemisms they're using now. We want them to have accurate information about prevalence, about impacts. We want them to have accurate information about the laws that protect against child sexual abuse and adult sexual assault. Oh, we've jumped ahead, marvellous. No, no, go back, go. <laughs> okay. The second area of recommendations are that we want, we believe that good news reporting in this area would be discouraging sexual offending. That means that we believe that reporters need to be describing sexual offending patterns accurately, that they need to be providing contact details for the specialist agencies that work with people with harmful sexual behaviour so that our communities know that behaviour can be changed. We want our news reports to stop giving excuses for sexual violence or giving undue weight to people who give excuses for sexual violence. We want some of the prevention stories that are currently happening in our communities to be told. And we want this, and this is a really simple thing, we want the cases where the police are choosing not to prosecute to be described like that. That's the language we want to be used. <clears throat> the third area of recommendations for the medium, we're asking them to respect, respect and support survivors of sexual violence. What this means, means is that we want them to be encouraging survivors to seek help. We want there to be contact details for our specialist survivor agencies around the country so people know where to go to seek help. We want them to be avoiding some of the victim blaming language that they're currently using and the focus on, on survive, what was going on for the survivor immediately before the sexual violence. And we want them to consider using graphic content warnings on stories which for many survivors and their families are likely to be triggering. That's the end of our first stream of work that's come out of the media audit. And I'm hopeful that that will make a significant difference. If we can get that into every student journalist in the country's little kit bag, I'm hoping that will make a significant difference down the line. 
The second stream of work that's come out of the media audit is to do with the New Zealand Police. Now, I said um, earlier that the police are only being quoted at the moment 17 per cent of the time. That's too low. Sexual violence is the most serious crime in terms of impact on victims. We know that. The police need to be part of that conversation in our media. So starting to talk to the police about what was going on for them around talking about sexual violence, what they said was that they were really nervous about talking to the media, that they know when they get it wrong that we hate it, <laughs> um, and also that they had quite a few stories where a senior police officer had given media commentary on a story and the media hadn't liked it. The media had gone to a more junior police officer who'd given comment on the story, the media didn't like it. The media had gone to a more junior officer still who wasn't even working on the case and that was the quote that was used in the story. Which is really interesting, eh? If we think about how we feel when we see police quoting to hear how that's actually happening. So what we did was we went into police national headquarters and talked to them about um, what they needed to do this work better. We showed them the results of the media audit and we went in to train all of the adult sexual assault managers in the country. We asked them what they wanted the New Zealand public to know when it came to sexual violence and with their consent I'm going to share some of the things that they've come up with. <clears throat> Garth, if you could just scroll through those, that would be awesome. So what they've come up with is a bunch of key media messages that are now in packs in every police station in New Zealand for, to assist the police in giving media commentary around sexual violence cases. They were really clear that they wanted to make sure the community knew that they supported survivors going to specialist sexual violence survivor agencies. They were really clear that they wanted to let the community know that they took complaints of sexual violence seriously. And Garth, if you could move on. And they also wanted to, from a police perspective, talk about how harmful some of those rape myths are. So I think the second bullet point on there, that most sexual offenders are known to their victims, New Zealand police would like to know them too. That was a way for the police to address that stranger danger stuff that we hear so much about. What they've done is they've taken those, combating those myths and put it in police language. Okay, these are just some of the messages. There's some, more, there's some more that I haven't included here today. But as I said, every police station in the country has these now. Two weeks after, can people read that? Cool. Two weeks after we did the training with adult sexual assault managers, I got an email from the adult sexual assault manager in Watamata. He was asking me for a chocolate fish. <laughs> and the reason was that a member of his staff who hadn't been at the training had used the key media messages in a story. This is what it said. So Detective Sergeant Murray Free is the recipient of the chocolate fish. He's talking about the help of counselling services, being critical to victims coming forward. He's encouraging victims to come forward. He's acknowledging that at least half of their investigations are of a historic nature. So he's getting rid of that idea that the police won't investigate historic events. And he's finishing with, please take complaints of sexual violence seriously and any report of sexual violence will be treated with respect and given confidentiality. Significant change in how we sometimes hear the police talking about sexual violence in our media, eh? <clears throat> okay. Third strand of work. If anyone hasn't been able to see this coming, I would be amazed. I don't believe I'm the most subtle of people. The next challenge is us, right? At the moment, we're being quoted 8% of the time if we're from a specialist agency and 0% of the time if we're a specialist researcher. This is so fixable. Imagine if the media were talking to us and still doing all the awful things that we just saw in that audit. They're not. We can fix this. We need to be developing relationships with journalists. We need to be talking about all of, the, all of our work around sexual violence. We need to be knowing we're going to get it wrong sometimes, because we are. We're going to get quoted sometimes, and we're not going to like the way it sounds. That's life. We need to know that our communities, our survivors, need us to be part of telling the story to the public in New Zealand. When we hold an event like this, we reach 130-odd people who carry that stuff back into the communities that you're doing work in. That's amazing and wonderful. 
When we're quoted in the media, we reach hundreds of thousands of people. We need to start using that exponential reach that the media has to change the story of sexual violence that the public's hearing. Now, I know that this is already happening all around the country in a whole bunch of ways. I know the work of Tuwahini and Rapin's, oh, I always get the Invercargill group's name wrong, Rape and Abuse Support Centre Southland's work in um, holding regular radio programs around sexual violence. We know that, in, um, that CAPS Hauraki are leading work around media um, reporting of child sexual abuse with radio programs, regular weekly newspaper articles, press coverage of the events that they hold. We know that people like Kim and Ken and Lou do astonishing work in talking about impacts on survivors. We know that Auckland Sexual Abuse Help Foundation and Wellington Rape Crisis have been really effective at letting their communities know about funding shortages. But my challenge to everyone in this room is to think about how we can start doing this work more proactively. Okay? One of my hopes for the next um, two years of the Tauiwi Prevention Project is that we'll begin to develop some training around this because I know people are nervous about talking to the media. But I truly believe that with training, we can really shift some of the ways the media is talking about sexual violence in this country, and we need to. It's a problem. I think if we can do all of that right, we, re re we really will be using the media to change the world. Thank you.